Hello, I'm Rachel McTavish and welcome to COPcast, an exciting series of programmes exploring the COP26 climate conference and why it's so important. I'm delighted to be joined today by Owen Hewlett, Chief Technical Officer from Gold Standard, Derek Brokoff from the Stockholm Environment Institute, Professor Tracy Osborne from the University of California, Merced, and Dr Matthew Brander from the University of Edinburgh Business School. In today's programme, we'll be looking at net zero and the great debate around carbon offsetting. Thank you all very much for joining us. Matthew, if I can start off with you, what is offsetting and why is it a particularly important issue at the moment? So carbon offsetting is essentially about balancing or compensating for your own emissions by buying or supporting emission reduction projects or removal enhancement projects elsewhere, outside of your own greenhouse gas inventory boundary. And actually there are a whole number of reasons why the prominence of carbon offsetting is, is rising up the agenda. One is that Article 6 uh, within the Paris Agreement is due hopefully to be agreed upon, the details will be agreed upon uh, in the COP in Glasgow this November. Another reason offsetting is, is moving up the agenda is that we have schemes like CORSIA, which is, I'll try to get the acronym right, it's Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, and that's expected to drive a very large increase in demand for carbon offsets over the next several decades. And we also have within the voluntary market, we have a large increase in demand from companies and other types of organization and subnational entity who are setting net zero targets. And companies and other organizations are then looking at how they can meet those net zero targets and inevitably they're looking at carbon offsetting as a way of doing that. For, so for a whole number of reasons, uh, offsetting is, is high on the agenda. Owen, what are some of the key concerns with carbon offsetting? Yeah, I think I think the concerns tend to fall into two categories. There's the the concerns with the act of offsetting itself. So so what Matthew just described is 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 right. And you know, one of the controversies with that is are you offsetting instead of taking action directly within your own uh, company boundary, for example. Um, so does it displace your ambition in some way? Um, so in, that's the act of offsetting. And then and then controversies to date have tended to focus on the the credits themselves so the efficacy of the credits used for the act of offsetting if you can accept that offsetting itself uh, is or is or can be credible then uh, you also have to do it well uh, and so there are various controversies around um you know the quality of the project and the quality of the credits um uh, used in the act of offsetting uh, derek are there any other uh, concerns that you have about carbon offsetting I think those are the main two, um, you know, the, the the use of the carbon credits and whether it's displacing climate ambition. And, you know, even yesterday uh, I saw an article describing carbon offsets as you know, a way for companies to uh, cheaply meet their commitments, you know, with a small fee paid to a renewable energy project developer, for example, they can uh, erase the carbon on their ledgers. And that's precisely the, uh, I would say, the wrong way to look at carbon offsetting. Uh, you should focus on your own emission reductions first. Um, and then secondly, as, Co as Owen said, uh, there've been, uh, th there's a long history of concerns about the quality of the carbon credits and whether they represent uh, true additional emission reductions that, uh, that effectively compensate for your emissions. Uh Tracy, do you think it is tempting to rely on carbon offsets for some companies as a, a primary means for meeting a carbon neutrality goal? No, I think there's a, there's certainly a lot of interest and increasing interest in carbon offsets. Um, I mean, just, you know, some of the concerns I, I also have and also that we see in the literature is not only, um, you know, sort of the, the additionality of some of these projects. Actually, there have been numerous studies that demonstrate that even on their own terms, carbon offsets um, have largely 
fail to reduce significantly reduce emissions. But I think also carbon offsets are, are especially through the CDM, through the clean development me mechanism, are also tasked with um, generating sustainable development in the host country. And um, there's also significant um, um, sort of literature review of the literature that sort of demonstrates that that also in terms of these local co-benefits, these sustainable development benefits that that um, projects have, have largely failed. There's certainly a lot of interest and growing interest among um, among um, companies and and various entities and even individuals on the on the voluntary market. And and I think that's that's a, a great thing. It, it just sort of demonstrates the real interest in um, in in taking action on, on climate change. Um, I think given some of these concerns and the controversies, we may need to to seriously reconsider um, how these projects and, and how these these um, offsets are implemented. Uh, Derek, do you think it's fair to say carbon offsetting has failed to contribute to significant carbon reductions? Uh, how much has it actually done? Yeah, that's um, it's an interesting question. It, has it been a distraction? Um, or, you know, it, is it of a piece with, I would say, our collective failure to uh, you know, marshal sufficient ambition to address climate change? I think it's a bit of both. Um, you know, the metaphor I like to use is that carbon offsets are kind of a leaky bucket. Uh, and if you're, you know, if, if you've got a bucket brigade going to put out a fire, uh, in some cases a leaky bucket can be an effective tool, especially if your alternative is maybe a bucket that doesn't leak, but it's really heavy, <laughs> uh, to stretch the metaphor here a little bit. Um, the problem is that you know we haven't been getting that bucket brigade going. Um, we've been pouring a little bit of water in these buckets and it's been draining out the holes. Uh, and so uh, we do need to tighten things up with carbon offsets. Um, I guess I'm not quite to the point of saying, let's forget them all together. Uh, I understand there are folks out there who do uh, hold that view. Um, but I think just given the general interest, uh, the renewed interest uh, lately in climate action, carbon offsetting, uh, they can be part of uh, a solution as long as they're used appropriately and as long as we do, um, you know, re-up our efforts to ensure the quality and integrity of uh, the kinds of projects that we're looking at here. Matthew, Derek just said that there's some people who suggest to scrap carbon credits altogether. If you do, what's the alternative? I mean, one alternative is just to concentrate on direct abatement. So this is when organisations or governments then just concentrate on mitigating emissions within, within their own greenhouse gas boundary. And as Derek suggested, I mean, the, the difficulty with that is that for some organizations, some countries, that is very, very difficult and very expensive. The other, or perhaps one of the main arguments in favor of carbon offsetting is if they are done well and we resolve some of the many challenges that they face, then they can offer a route to achieving mitigation at low cost or least cost. That also then means we can increase our ambition possibly and do more climate change mitigation if we have access to ways of reducing emissions without you know, without bankrupting society in, in, in doing that. Um, yeah. Uh, Tracy, do you think that um, carbon offset credits are perhaps being used as a substitute for, for real climate action by some companies? I think you know, I mean, there certainly are are a number of countries that are um, reducing emissions um, within their own, you know, within their own boundaries, um, and you know, it, as a means to be carbon neutral or even carbon negative, they're they're investing in in um, in carbon offsets, and and that's it, you know, that's the 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 best use of of carbon offsets. Um, are there companies that are probably using it as a, as as a way to bypass? Um, you know, not all all entities are required, but you know, a lot of companies are actually doing it voluntarily. So I think that it's it's probably mixed. Um, but I think I, I'd say that you know the best use of offsets is to make as many 
reductions within within the the, the boundaries of of the entity first, and um, but I think that the, there's also real benefits to um, sort of encouraging governments to make wider system wide changes, so that all energy use within that uh, of of that of that company um, can also be. Uh, Companies can also reduce their own their own um, emissions by, um, you know, encouraging governments to make more system wide changes within the energy system. Derek, you were nodding in an agreement to that. Yeah, I think Tracy's right that uh, I think one encouraging sign is there, to my eyes anyway, there is a bit of a paradigm shift going on with the focus on net zero. Um, uh, that in most conversations I'm seeing around. In some cases, it's treated as kind of the new word for carbon neutrality, which I think is a problem. But in most cases, I would say there's this focus on long-term uh, emission reductions, getting emissions down as close to zero as possible, and uh, focusing on uh, your own you know, corporate or, or, or organizational uh, footprint first looking to offsets second. And I think that's the right way to approach things. Um, and I, I agree with Tracy as well that um, I guess what I'm hopeful for is that uh, that framing also encourages a shift towards thinking about the larger systemic uh, you know, changes that need to take place. I think one of the problems with uh, the carbon neutrality framing, which is what we've had with us for the last couple decades, um, is that it's focused so narrowly on, uh, you know, a corporation's own carbon footprint. So it's kind of saying, you know, I've neutralized my emissions. I'm no longer part of the problem. And what we really need to focus on is not just not being part of the problem, but being part of the global solution. And, uh, and I, I, I'm hopeful that we can see a shift towards more of that kind of thinking, looking at um, these external mitigation investments, once you've reduced your own emissions, uh, as uh, you know, looking at ways to contribute to global uh, collective net zero outcomes, uh, as opposed to just, I've got my own neck of the woods covered. Uh, Owen, how do you make that shift and get this collective thinking? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think one of the big missing pieces of the puzzle and, and Derek sort of got at this point there is, you know, we need to, uh, we as civil society, as citizens, as, as you know, the, the sustainability organizations need to be clear with companies on the behaviors that we're looking to see from them. What is credible corporate behavior in the context of averting the climate emergency and then make sure that the claims reflect that authentically and honestly. So, so I think what Derek just described is a situation of the other way around where carbon neutrality as a claim kind of grew out of common practice in the absence mm -hmm. of, of that legitimacy and clarity. And it sort of ended up defining corporate behaviors, which is completely the wrong way around. So, you know, from, from, from my perspective, I always think that, you know, we should start with the behaviors we want to see develop an honest but compelling you know i think we should reward companies that do the right thing with with a compelling thing to tell their consumers or or investors um and then from there build mechanisms and if offsetting is one of the mechanisms that can add up to that claim that can add up to that behavior then it has legitimacy but we, we, we've sort of answered the question from the wrong way around i think for the last 10-15 uh, years matthew how's the voluntary carbon market evolved because that that's that started about mid 90s didn't it uh, yeah, I mean, the, I guess the market has evolved enormously. Um, we've got the emergence of um, certification standards like gold standard and, and, and others that are out there. Um, whereas at the very beginning, there was, there was very little um, good certification. In terms of evolution, I mean, I think the other big issue that we, we will come on to is the issue of where does the voluntary carbon market exist under the Paris Agreement? And the issue here is that with the Paris Agreement, all parties, all countries that have signed up now have emission reduction targets. And if you have a voluntary carbon offset project within a host country and the reduction in emissions from that project 
is counted by that host country towards meeting their target, then arguably that level of emissions would have been, would have, have been achieved anyway mm -hmm. through the host country having to fulfill its target. So the problem is that the offset project isn't achieving a level of emissions below what would have happened anyway. And that's the crucial feature for an offset to be an offset. It has to, in order to balance out emissions elsewhere, it has to achieve a lower level of emissions than otherwise would have, would have occurred. And so, yeah, thinking about the evolution of the voluntary carbon market, that's 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 one big question that 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 market is is grappling with at the moment. And there's a lot of uh, controversy and contestation about. What, was, what the, the future holds. Tracy, are there any points you want to pick up on there? Well, in terms of the, the voluntary market, I, I'd, I'd like to say, uh, maybe make a, a, a few, um, reflect a, a bit on the forestry-based uh, climate change mitigation strategies. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of work in um, Southern Mexico, um, really looking at the, um, the voluntary carbon market and how it plays out uh, in um, small communities, forest communities in um, in Chiapas, and I think there are real concerns about um, questions of permanence. You know whether or not these these forests and the, the carbon will be stored over long periods of time. There there certainly have been been issues of leakage. Whether you know protecting forests in in the project area, if those due to market needs, if if those if deforestation or degradation will take place elsewhere, um, as well as the additionality um, that that was mentioned. So these are really these are real concerns. They're mm -hmm. they're um, particularly an issue with the um, with forest based projects, mm -hmm. which is why you know EU ETS have been very cautious about including. Forest uh, forest offsets is this part of the the EU ETS. Um, there's there was a lot of controversy also within the California's carbon market with including um, forest uh, carbon offsets as well due to some of these these concerns of additionality, permanence, and leakage. These are the the um, the environmental integrity issues. Do you think, uh, Tracy, staying with you, do you think enough buyers are asking questions about permanence when they're buying the, the carbon offset, offset credits? I think buyers are certainly, you know, they're investing in in climate change mitigation, in, in climate act. They're taking climate action through these offsets. Um, they want to make sure that that their investment's going to actually generate real mm -hmm. um, and meaningful uh, change on the ground. Um, I, you know, I, I might, I might ask Owen to sort of speak to the gold standard. I mean, the gold standard has also been very cautious about the inclusion of, of forest offsets, um, and rightfully so. I mean, there's uh, forests are incredibly important um, as as sinks, um, and also, you know, they're really important because if you protect forests, you, pre you know, you're protecting forests, you're pre you're preventing the um, emissions of of um, of carbon. You're preventing carbon emissions, but also forests are important because they draw down carbon that's already in the atmosphere. There's an enormous opportunity for us to um, think about sort of forest spaces as, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a space for climate change mitigation. Um, to date, just given the some of these environmental integrity issues that I mentioned, but also I think there's also a, a deep concern um, just sort of more generally or more broadly in thinking about these mar about market mechanisms and the impacts that market mechanisms have on mm -hmm. on these projects. So, for example, just going back to the the, the work that I've done in Chiapas, Mexico, um, there's an understanding. I mean, the, the market mechanisms and market logic is used specifically as a means to um, generate carbon benefit at the lowest cost. It's about it's a cost efficiency argument. And because of that, the price, the carbon price was quite low. And so the the sort of the benefits to smallholders um, was also quite low. And the result was that 
the these projects failed to address the real drivers of deforestation in the region. So while smallholder land uses, subsistence land uses was often targeted, large scale cattle ranching was able to continue, mm. you know, unabated. Uh, Owen, if I can just pick up for, on something that Tracy mentioned, their gold standard have a portfolio of projects that prioritise health, well-being, clean water, sanitation. Uh, it, it, in fact, if you go onto your website, it's incredibly easy. You can literally add add a project to your cart, however many tons you want to you want to offset. How do you actually verify what's what's the, the gold standard way of verifying these projects? Yeah, so the, the way we the way you calculate the number of carbon credits in a carbon project like this is, is based on a, a on a counterfactual. So, uh, you know, before I came along, I was at scenario A. I replaced that with scenario B, which you would hope would be improving the situation in some way. And the improvement between A and B is the number of carbon credits. And and that is a uh, you know I've made that sound very simple. Well, I'm not sure I did actually, but it sounded very simple. Um, but but in reality, you know, there's a there's a lot of gymnastics to get from A to B. Um, we have over 40 methodologies for different project types. You know, each complicated and unique in its own way um, to get to that number. Um, and the way it, it's verified is, uh, you know, we have a, a, a kind of stage at the beginning of a project when. You, know, you check the design is sound and that the methodology is being applied properly and that you know sustainable development is being contributed to safeguards are being planned for um, stakeholders included um, so you sign that off and then as the project progresses periodically they're they're verified which means an auditor will go to site they'll review the evidence and decide uh, if all of those things are still being met and, and assuming that's the case uh, report back to us that scenario b if you like is in full swing as you intended uh, and from there, we would issue carbon credits, provided they met our our standard. Uh, if you see what I mean. Uh, and you've also got climate plus rather than carbon neutral as well, haven't you? Just as as you say, pushing for that extra extra shove. Yeah, and I, I said earlier, and and I think I think everybody sort of mentioned it in some form or another that that you know these these are almost placeholder claims at this point where you know we know that they're going to be replaced by something hopefully that has civil society legitimacy and that we can all buy into so uh, it may it may still be something like climate plus or carbon positive climate positive you know i personally not so hung up on those semantics provided it's true to the behavior and the and the mechanisms used yeah so uh matthew do all programs require independent verification or can somebody say I estimate that this will be the benefit. How is it? How is it handled? Yeah, I mean, most of the main standards do require third party verification. Um, it is possible. And I think we've seen this just in the last year or two that some credits that have been offered to the market have just been done independently of a certification standard. So a project developer has just picked up a, a fairly generic standard like the ISO standard for project accounting um, and has has sold credits and um, you know I think it's up to the buyer to then look at whether that is sufficient um, uh, proof that the, the project is real and credible and achieving what it claims to achieve um, so yeah I mean for the most part third-party verification exists in the market um, yeah. Uh, Derek, can we can we look at this problem of double counting? Uh, what what are the solutions to that particular issue? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. So uh, as Matthew was saying earlier, I think the elephant in the room these days is how to reconcile offsetting the voluntary carbon market with uh, the Paris Agreement, where every country in the world has now pledged to reduce emissions. Uh, and Rachel, you were noting that the voluntary carbon market had its origins back in the 1990s. Uh, you know, that's I'm dating myself. That's when I got my start um, working in this space. I think from day one, we all imagined a world in which carbon offsets would become obsolete uh, because every country, every entity in the world would be taking climate change seriously and reducing emissions. 
So there would be nowhere to go, in essence, um, to pay someone else to reduce emissions for you. You'd have to focus on reducing your own carbon footprint. And maybe we're not quite there, but you know, nominally, that's the situation we're in, at least uh, with the Paris Agreement. And so uh, the question is, you know, if you're a voluntary entity looking to offset your emissions, can you simply count an emission reduction that uh, is covered by a pledge that a country has made to reduce emissions? Um, if you do try to count that reduction, I would argue it's not a valid offset, right? Because the country, you have to assume the country would make good on its pledge, mm -hmm. that reduction would happen anyway. So there, if you want to make an offsetting claim, there needs to be some mechanism in place uh, where the country essentially relinquishes its claim to the emission reduction, says, okay, um, I'm not going to count this emission reduction or this removal towards my NDC achievement, uh, noting that the carbon offset purchaser has claimed it to uh, offset their own emissions. So there are ways, so, sorry. No, so, so I was going to say, so how do you, how do you correct that? Yeah, so that, there, there are ways to do that. It gets, uh, this gets into um, COP26 and what's on the agenda there. So one of the big items uh, on the agenda for COP26 is to uh, resolve what's called the Article 6 rule book. Article 6 is the uh, uh, part of the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, that uh, basically allows for or recognizes the potential for international collaboration in addressing climate change where you know a country could invest in mitigation in another country, um, reduce emissions and count those reductions towards its own NDC pledge, for example. And there's an, an architecture that's under negotiation there for how to do the international accounting um, so that the emission reductions are not double counted, that it's only one country that can count each ton of mitigation. And there's no reason in principle that that accounting architecture couldn't be used in the context of the voluntary market, that countries would agree under these international rules to not count emission reductions if there's a voluntary buyer that wants to count them. Um, that of course would have to be negotiated um, I would not expect countries to just simply give up their right to an emission reduction for free, um, but uh, that hopefully we get those rules in place um, and we can work out a system where uh, you know that the standards can go to the countries and get a commitment to not count those emission reductions. And in fact, that's you know I think it was Matthew who mentioned. Corsia earlier, this mm -hmm. uh, international aviation carbon offsetting scheme, that is one of the fundamental principles of that scheme. Um, I was part of an effort a couple of years ago along with Owen to work out some guidelines uh, for how that kind of accounting could be implemented. Um, and under Corsia, there, you know, there are these guardrails against um, just counting emission reductions that countries are also counting towards their NDCs. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful we get that agreement out of COP26 and that we can get the, this, these mechanisms in place to avoid that kind of double counting. Tracy, these sound like enormous mechanisms to try and get in place. Do we have the time? Is time running out for us? I think so. You know, the IPC is very clear, has been very clear, the 2018 um, IPCC report on 1.5 was really clear that if we continue business as usual, we will hit the 1.5 degrees um, above uh, pre-industrial levels by the year 2030. So, you know, we're getting very close to that, that, that time. We're nine years away. Um, so there's urgency around this issue. Um, you know, my concern is that given we've been investing in carbon offsets, the voluntary market since the mid 1990s and the you know, it, it's it's there have been numerous studies, including an EU study. That was really clear that of of the that that um, the the lack of additionality in about 85 percent of the um, of the projects studied. And that's that's quite high, and and just sort of given a, a, a um, sort of much of the much of the the um, the scholarship on on carbon offsets, I'm concerned given the urgency of the issue, mm -hmm. given the, the the IPCC report, that 
we may want to consider investing much more of our our carbon our climate action on strategies that have are that have a, a much better chance of reducing emissions and and for me i think you know some of the policy changes um you know sort of regulations state government re regulations um you know but also really considering uh, you know carbon carbon taxes carbon fees and dividends uh, and and sort of policy changes that have much um sort of more systemic uh on can lead to more systemic transformations within um, within country governments. Uh, oh, and you're nodding in agreement there. Which which strategies do you think need to be focused on? Well, I, I think you know first just to say I, I thousand percent agree with what Derek was sharing about the nature of of double claiming and double counting, um, and that you know you, you simply don't have an offset without it. Um, and I think the the issue is if we assume that you know, take the, the the counter argument that that's just too much of an impediment in, in in to investment in these climate projects. Then, then you what you're doing is redefining what offsetting what offsetting is to suit what you're actually able to do. And and given what Tracy just said about the, the high percentage of projects and credits that don't have that efficacy in the first place, if we're then lowering the bar on what it means, what you're doing is is putting money in a bad place. Ultimately, um, mm -hmm. we, we have. A period of time left, an amount of money, and an amount of brain power, and amount of energy, and uh, my my optimistic view is we have enough of those things to avert the climate emergency enough. Um, but we we don't avert it if we spend the money and the energy we have as inefficiently as that. Um, we just don't have that luxury. Uh, Matthew, the additionality problem is an issue that crops up frequently when you're looking at carbon offsets. How do we define what is extra? What's What's the baseline it's being measured against? So, I mean, well, Owen mentioned earlier that we have methodologies for different project types. And essentially, the test for uh, additionality is the, the A and B scenarios that, uh, that Owen described earlier. We need to identify credibly what would have happened in the absence of an offset project. So that's the baseline. And then we need to credibly identify the level of emissions that's been achieved by the, the project itself. And if there is a difference between those two scenarios, then essentially you have reduced emissions. There is, there is additionality in terms of the outcome. There are also additionality tests that look at whether the specific activity that you're implementing would have happened anyway. And those tests aren't perfect by a long way. And the, the studies that Tracy mentioned that find very low levels of actual additionality in projects that have been certified and, and issued credits is, is very, very high. So um, one way of thinking about additionality is in terms of probability. What's the, what's the likelihood that the project would not have happened anyway in the absence of the revenue, the finance or support from the, from the carbon market. Mm -hmm. And what you want to do obviously is focus in on projects that have a high likelihood of being additional and move away from projects that have a very low likelihood. And, and lots of standards are now moving away from renewable energy offset projects just because the cost of renewable technologies is so competitive with other forms of energy generation the likelihood, the probability of additionality is is low. Um, but yeah, additionality has long been a, a, a thorny and, and difficult problem to address. Uh, Derek, we've fo focused a lot on some of the challenges with offsets. Let's focus now on some of the key positives. Yeah, sure. So, I, I mean, the the upside of offsetting um, or, you know, alternatively, uh, you know, just investing in external mitigation uh, is that you can get all kinds of positive co-benefits with the kinds of projects that we're talking about. So even if it's renewable energy, right, putting aside the additionality issues there, um, which can be real, uh, you know, the more we invest in clean energy, uh, the more that benefits not just climate change, but also local pollution generation, 
uh, air quality, uh, so on and so forth. Um, same goes for the land use sector, uh, you know, avoided deforestation projects done right, um, done well uh, in ways that respect uh, indigenous rights, for example, uh, can also uh, generate all kinds of uh, ecosystem benefits, um, whether it's you know wildlife preservation or uh, uh, preservation of ecosystems and things like that. So there's a whole range of these uh, different kinds of mitigation efforts that not only help us address climate change, but um, promote sustainable development generally. And that, that's one of the big attractions of uh, offsetting. Um, sometimes, and not to <laughs> turn back to being too cautious, but sometimes to the at the expense of um, a focus on you know reducing your own emissions. I think for a lot of companies, even the ones that have committed to ambitious action within their own value chains, for example, uh, it's often sexier a bit to talk about how you're protecting wildlife in Tanzania, for example, um, as opposed to the efficiency improvements you've made in your data farms. Um, and so that's uh, th that's something that has to be navigated there. But uh, you know, done right, uh, these things can can really be a beneficial uh, kind of investment. Uh, Tracy, over the last 12 months, have you seen any discernible shift with companies, businesses moving towards more sustainable investment? Do we have the perfect storm now for a positive outcome with the uh, US rejoining the Paris Agreement lockdown? People, more self-examination, COP26 around the corner. Has it all come together at once? I mean, I'm very excited about um, some of the, you know, obviously the, the US rejoining the Paris Agreement. Um, there's been a lot more attention and um, mo positive movement forward in, in toward um, taking climate action. And I think one of the things that's particularly um, inspiring is the attention to um, environmental justice, that recognizing that climate action must also pay attention to um, um, social justice and environmental justice issues. Um, so I agree with 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 a lot of what Derek said, that if these projects are done right, there's uh, enormous possibility for supporting the types of projects that might contribute to climate justice. And some of those would certainly include, um, you know, supporting indigenous land tenure, uh, indigenous people's land tenure and, and, and um, forest communities land tenure. And we know that you know, indigenous peoples and local communities, um, when their land tenure is recognized, that they they're, they're actually um, the rate of deforestation in these areas can be something like three to four times lower than similar land uh, under state or, or private control. So it, it, it would require a is there a perfect storm? I, I think there is, you know, COVID has really um, sort of forced us to think differently mm -hmm. about crisis and that, you know, these crises, the, the, the climate crisis is actually uh, um, uh, uh, upon us as well. And just sort of what, when when um, the global community comes together and citizens sort of take action that, you know, we 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 had to do this with, with COVID in certain ways. So I think we're, it's it's a kind of a precursor to, um, to, to sort of taking sort of global action on, on climate. Um, but I, I think, yeah, com a combination of what we've seen with with COVID um, and the sort of the massive shifts that it, it's required us to take, but also the possibilities um, with in in the United States. Also, there's a lot more interest and uh, of of um, youth and climate justice and environmental justice um, organizations pushing for the Green New Deal and, and similar types of policies. So and we're, we're now, you know, moving coming up to um, COP26. So I think it's I'm really excited to see what what um, some of the possibilities and, and forward movement around climate action that comes through this this next COP, given 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 what we've seen, particularly in 2020. Uh, Matthew, we've been talking a lot, a lot about um, businesses, large companies. Uh, how do you encourage the general population, citizens themselves, to consider their carbon emissions and, and to think about offsetting? Yeah, I and mean, I think there is a lot of interest among people generally. I mean, when I um, hear what my kids are talking about in school, they're joining climate change clubs and 
um, yeah, I think there's a real movement within society generally, this, this need for action. Um, and perhaps all of the issues that come up at, a, say, a company or an organizational level apply at an individual level. People can think about how they can reduce their own emissions. You know, they can eat less red meat, perhaps. They can drive less, fly less, buy a smaller car, etc. And they can also think about buying offsets. And as you mentioned, looking at the gold standard website, you know, it's very easy to go on and, and, and look at projects. And I mean, one possible way of thinking about carbon credits is not to think of them as offsets. You don't necessarily have to buy a carbon credit because you want to say that you've achieved neutrality or you've offset your emissions. You could go on to, and not just to talk about gold standard, there are other mm. providers out there as well, but you can buy carbon credits just because you want to achieve emission reductions mm. And importantly, support projects that also achieve these other co-benefits that, that Derek and Tracy have talked about. So again, you need to be careful about which projects you, you you buy into, but you can, as an individual, just see it more as a uh, a contribution to tackling the climate crisis rather than it having to be about having neutralised your own emissions. And if you think about it that way. You don't have to stop at buying the number of credits that match your emissions. You could buy five times that amount, ten times, um, and 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 contribute more. Owen, oh, are you seeing individuals buying um, buying carbon credits? Yeah, very much so. And uh, one of the things I like about um, in the kind of optimistic frame of mind here about about carbon markets, so set aside offsets for a second, um, is that. You know what a market is trying to do is allow mass participation just like we don't all grow our, our own food we go to a supermarket um it, it's similar we can't we don't all have that much land uh, we we don't all have the money to invest in very expensive um climate mitigation actions in tanzania to use derek's example so it's a way of participating in something that you there is no other way to do that right how you know how, how else could you do that um so i think it's a really nice way of 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 participating in uh, mitigation action and then in terms of individuals i would say our marketplace um well it, the, the dynamics are changing actually it, it's interesting companies certainly participate in that marketplace on our website uh, it started life predominantly individuals and sort of small businesses and, and it's kind of the dynamic changes almost every day it's an interesting mm -hmm. time um, but certainly i would say a large proportion of those purchases are are individuals um, you know, of varying volumes, people buying, you know, a credit or people buying a, 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 a much larger number of credits for themselves and their families. Um, and there's been some quite famous, I can't actually say who they are because a lot of them are anonymous, <laughs> but there's been some, some quite famous names. Yeah. Uh, finally, very briefly, if I can just uh, quickly go round you and ask, what are your hopes for COP26? Oh, and if I start, start with you, what do you want to see top of the agenda in just a couple of sentences? I, well, I think, you know, I, I actually don't think some of the technical solutions that will come out of the rule book are essential for us to move ahead with a lot of things. So I think my, my number one takeaway is let's just get on with the stuff that we can do. We have options, but also to contradict, contradict myself immediately, <laughs> it is nice to get things done and send that message. So let's get it finished. Yeah. Uh, Tracy. I'd like to see a lot more attention to um, issues of climate justice and addressing some of the more um, sort of fundamental drivers of climate change, some of, and, and, and sort of making, you know, the types of strategies that are going to lead to more sort of transformative uh, systems change. Uh, Derek. Yeah, seconds to, to all of that. Um, I am hopeful of uh, a positive outcome on the Article 6 negotiations in particular. And what I'd like to see, um, I don't know if it's on the table for COP26 or maybe further down the road, but you know, is further integration between the Paris regime and voluntary climate action recognition on both sides of what the other is doing um, and uh, you know, orienting these markets towards that collective uh, climate action outcome that, that we all need to see. Climate change is a systemic problem. Um, and so we need to think systemically about it and integrating these efforts in a way that can um, raise ambition globally. Finally, Matthew. 
Well, I, I was going to say two things. I mean, one is from a, from a Scottish perspective, we're going to be welcoming the world. And I just hope it doesn't rain on everyone for two <laughs> weeks in, in Glasgow. Um, and also, I, I hope that the COP is this great opportunity for momentum. I think it, it draws attention to, to climate change um, enormously. And so it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for, for momentum, for galvanizing action, um, whether that's through the international negotiations themselves or just general societal movement awareness on, on climate change. Well, that's all we've got time for. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Remember, there are a host of other programmes in the COPcast series, so keep a close eye on our social media pages. Search for COP26Cast, brought to you in association with the University of Edinburgh Business School. Many thanks to all our guests today and to you for watching. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>